Gracious Heavenly Father, I stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the access that you've given us to approach boldly the throne of grace in time of need. I just ask your blessing upon this study this, as we continue to study in the epistle to the Romans. I thank you, Father, that you died in our place, that we were buried, crucified, buried, and raised with you to walk in newness of life. I ask that you would filter out all the foolishness and all the ignorance, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth, and to be consistent with your word, Lord, for it's in your name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. It's a hot, humid, typical day here in southeast Oklahoma. No rain yet, but swarms of mosquitoes. I wanted to continue on with our study in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse. And we, when we left off in our last uh, video, we were in chapter 11. I want to quickly just review... The, the few verses that we covered, beginning with verse 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people, God forbid. And as I pointed out, God has not cast away his people, Israel. So this is the context of uh, our study as we go into chapter 11. And as I pointed out also in, in my last video, there were no chapter divisions. And, and so the thought from chapter 10 is continuing on in chapter 11. Paul considers it important that he point out that, that he of all people was being a Jew of the Jews uh, of the tribe of, of Benjamin, the seed of Abraham, that God had not cast him away. And We've been spending some time talking about the subject of divine election, a not too popular subject, but we can't avoid that, that doctrine, the doctrine of divine election, as, as so many do. And, and, and in order to be consistent uh, as we go along and we study His Word, or that one verse uh, precept, we, we build upon our, our doctrine, folks, is our, our theological position is built precept upon precept. Uh, if we run into any, any verse that contradicts any other, then our theology is not consistent. And I want to really impress upon you the importance of, of that fact that we are to be, we, we need to be consistent. It's only when we are consistent uh, in dealing with the text that the text becomes clear to us and, and we uh, we receive, I believe, what I believe is is the the thought, the thought that the Holy Spirit intended to convey. And if we're not consistent with the text, then we tend to become then uh, guilty of eisegesis, reading into it, you know, what we might believe, think that that the text says. As we uh, went on, continued on. Uh, through the first, uh, I believe, six verses of chapter 11, we saw that there were uh, God uh, assured uh, us that there were 7,000 men who have not bowed uh, the knee to the image of Baal. God had his people there. And I pointed out how I believe that, that evangelism is, is basically... Uh, in a nutshell, amounts to our bringing the good news to God's people. Whether we want to accept it or not, whether we like it or not, whether we feel it's just or not, right or not, uh, God does have His people. And this this book is primarily addressed to His people. It doesn't have, it has very little to say to the non-believer except for judgment. Uh, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. But why do you not hear my voice? Because you are not my sheep. And so, if I can keep the mosquitoes away from me here, because I've got to keep an eye on this cantankerous mare of mine back here. She tends to break loose from the high line and, and decide to go roaming off on her own. 
and I've, I've got some fence down that I've got to put back up so I've got them on a high line because they're they're in need of all of this uh, luscious green grass that God has, has seen by his grace to to grow for us here even though we can't cut hay at this present time but to, to continue on here there's something here that I think you're going to find quite remarkable if you can hang with me on, on the thought of this. Uh, we looked at, at uh, in verse 6, if, and if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. And, and so we can't mix the two. We can't mix law and grace. It's not, and I think I even pointed out the fact how that it, I have actually heard uh, sermons preached on Ephesians 1 where we were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world only for that message, that sermon, to conclude with the fact that, well, all this is true of you uh, only if you do something. You know, whatever that case might be, whether it's it's believe, repent, accept, be baptized, receive, or anything else. And if you followed this ministry, if you followed this channel, you know that my position is is John 1.13. We're born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. And so anything that we do, because we were spiritually dead and had to be quickened to life first before we could do anything, anything that we do, any response on our part, was a result of our new birth, not the cause of it. That is a highly crucial point in all of this discussion. And it does put me at odds with much of modern evangelism, much of modern Christianity today. Now, the, the common thought, even among those of us who understand this, these truths, is that uh, all of those who don't, you know, uh, understand and believe and accept uh, the marvelous truths of God's sovereign grace and election and that we're under grace, not law, uh, and primarily based upon the fact that uh, modern Christianity teaches a, a works-oriented, human merit-based uh, system of relationship that, you know, we are then God's elect and the rest are not. In fact, for many years, I believed that myself. I don't, I don't believe that is the case at all. And I believe that our, our current text is going to uh, bring out strongly the fact. I, I want you to look at the text, folks. I want you to see for yourself. Don't just take my word for, for this or anything else. It's dangerous for you to take and believe something just because I believe it. Study to show yourselves approved a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I think that what you will see in this text is the remarkable fact, and I, I want to refer back to Isaiah chapter 63. In Isaiah chapter 63, I believe it's chapter 60, 63, uh, we find a remarkable uh, statement uh, by Isaiah. Isaiah 63, 17. O Lord, why hast thou made us, that is, we, your people, to err from thy ways and hardened our heart? Uh, highlight that word hardened. I'm going to touch a little bit more on that word. Hardened our heart from thy fear. Return for thy servants' sake the tribes of thine inheritance. Why hast thou made us to err from thy ways and hardened our heart? I want you to take note of the fact that, and, just, and this gets back to the to the consistency, you know, subject. Uh, and think of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. He was always God's child. There was never a time when, in which Paul was not God's child. God chose Paul in Christ before the foundation of the world. In fact, every single one of God's elect, we have, a right, we have every right to say that they were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. 
No one has ever been redeemed, folks, by what they do. No one's ever been redeemed by works. It's always been by grace. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And if Paul had died on the road to Damascus before that conversion took place, he would have been one of God's elect. That's the first thing I want you to, to take into consideration here. I want you to factor that into the to this equation. I also want you to think about a very interesting fact here that you know we're lo all looking for the rapture and if the rapture was to take place right now uh, there's a little very little doubt that there would be uh, pastors left alone in their pulpits with half their congregation or more missing and they would uh, classify they would be they would fall into that category of those that we refer to as those left behind does that mean that they're lost well absolutely not of course not they would go into the tribulation period now correct me please write me and correct me if I'm wrong these individuals would go into the tribulation period because they were never truly born again into the body of Christ they weren't baptized into the church and so they would go into the tribulation period and if they were saved if they, in, in the sense of, of redeemed, if they came to, to know Christ during that period, and they, they became a martyr for their faith, then that would have been, as a result of that divine election, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, but they weren't raptured. Why weren't they raptured? Because we are also, according to Peter, we're born again, not only just according to his will, but we're born again according to his timing. And so it wasn't, it wasn't their time. And I pointed out an important fact in my last video, and that is, and it was based on, on many of the articles that I have in my study about commentators, too, that, who, have, who have said, well, if, if Israel had just received their Messiah and accepted the kingdom, then God would have ushered in the kingdom and they would have ruled and reigned with Christ for a thousand years and everything would have just been great. No, it would not have, because there would have never been a cross, never been a redemption, never, never we would have never been, uh, pro, God would have never been propitiated. We, we would have never been, there would have never been a church. There wouldn't have been anything. God's salvation would not have come to the Gentiles. It was a result of, of, of the disobedience of a nation of people that God elected to redeem. That we even are sitting here having this discussion it's the whole reason why the, the salvation came to the Gentiles now that is a highly crucial highly important fact to consider it is my suggestion and, and I don't ask anyone to agree with me on this or not based upon the fact that Moses was on the Mount of Transfiguration yet he didn't enter the promised land because of his unbelief and Joshua and Caleb they only entered into the promised land. So many of God's people perished in the wilderness. Well, so, okay, Steve, so they went to hell, right? No, they did not go to hell. I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's an insane, idiotic, I'm sorry to, to say, you know, idea is that God redeemed a million and a half people out of Egypt, and, and he only redeemed a couple of them. I mean, poor God, you know. He redeems a, a million and a half people, and he can only save a couple. Are you following me along here with this? Because I, I think it has a really important bearing on our present study, our, our present text. As we continue on here in, in chapter 11, and I'm going to read these verses. This is, a, this is a verse 7. What then Israel hath not obtained that which, which it, and the word is it in the original text, not he, in which it seeketh for. And if we stop right there, I think there's clear, enough clear evidence that Israel, you know, through the law, keeping the law, the sacrifices, and all of the temple ordinances and everything, they truly were seeking after God. But they didn't obtain that which they sought after. 
but the election hath obtained it. Very important phrase here, folks. And the rest were blinded. Now, most of modern Christianity, most, most modern commentators, most articles that you read, most television shows that you watch, most, much of, of the radio broadcasts that you listen to, most, most every Christian's comment on that verse is, is that, well, what that is saying is, is that that's talking about, well, they went to hell. The rest were blinded. I want you to understand something that in the original text, the word, and I don't know why the translators put blinded, the word is hardened. It's the same word for, for God hardening the heart of Pharaoh. Now, I just got through reading, just got through reading uh, here, and I, I'll, I don't mind reading this again. Just got through reading here in Isaiah 63, where that Isaiah says, O Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways and harden our heart? Now, I hope you can see where I'm going with this. I, I, folks, I'm going to take the unpopular position. And, and again, I, I don't ask anyone to agree with anything that I say ever at any time. Please don't. But this is my position on this. That what we're reading, what we're looking at, what we're studying here in the 11th chapter of the Epistle to the Romans is that in verse 7, where, where it says, and the rest were hardened, that these are God's people. They're not goats. They're not goats. First of all, I, I want to... I want to point out the fact that if these were goats, if you took these as goats, okay, it would make, to me, it would make absolutely no sense that God would harden a goat. Now, now some of you might disagree with that fact. You, you might suggest to me, and, 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 and I'm, I'm willing to entertain the notion, uh, and, and I'm not, you know, I could be wrong here, but I can imagine someone coming to me and saying, Steve, yeah, but okay, uh, you know, what you're saying, Steve, is you're saying that you have a hard time understanding why God would even bother hardening a goat or hardening tear. Uh, but, Steve, I, I can see how that that's exactly what God does. That that's exactly why they are a goat, and that's exactly why they are tear, is because God hardened them. So, to be fair... Okay, uh, you know, I, I don't blame you for taking that approach. But the context, folks, the overall context is God is promising deliverance for his people. If, if you could sum up the entire context here of the passage that we're dealing with, it is God has promised not to forsake his people. And I think that is crucially important. Of course, context is always important. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. They can be God's elect, folks, just as Paul was one of God's elect before his conversion. They can be one of God's elect just as the pastor that's left behind at the rapture could be one of God's elect who is converted comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ in the tribulation period, but he was always one of God's elect. That's my point. And just as in the same way that God allowed the disobedience of his people to make it possible for you and I to even be having this discussion, to make it possible for you and I to be redeemed, to make it possible for us to come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Whereas we tend to look at it, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry, folks. I can't look at God's people, Israel, and say, oh, you know, and, and make two, two false conclusions. One is, is that, well, God was, we, we serve this really poor God. He was, you know, he redeemed, you know, only a few people out of, out of, out of millions. 
I can't, I can't come to that conclusion. Or that neither can I come to the conclusion that it's, he's really not divinely sovereign when it comes to the matter of redemption. Ultimately, man holds the final trump card, so to speak. And then, which contradicts John 1.13, born again by the will of God, not according to the will of man or the will of the flesh. So God's, God's really not faithful. He's not sovereign. Man is. And, and those are, are basically the conclusions that you have to come to. At least I'm, I'm forced to come to. Unless, unless you look at this from the perspective of divine election which is what the text is teaching. Folks, who, who are we to say that there's something wrong? Uh, the illustration's often been used. Uh, you've got this, you've got a father, he, you've got a picture here, and the father of, is spanking his son along, you know, he, he's, he's grabbing him, pushing him along, you know, smacking him around a little bit, trying to get him to, to move along driving him, you know, kind of like I, I have to drive, you know, uh, well, kind of like how I had to drive this mule that we used to have, that we no longer have. He, she, he got old and, and, and passed on. But, you know, kind of like you, you'd drive a cattle, okay? And you got this picture, and his father's doing this, and it looks awful, looks bad. I mean, it's, you know, guys should ought to be arrested, right? You know? Until you understand the whole picture, that they're in the mountains, there's there's a foot of snow, that the temperatures are dropping below zero, and he's trying to get his son to safety. So we can't make the judgment that what's going on is wrong until we have the whole picture. Same is true with a surgeon. You've got a surgeon, you know, he's amputated this guy's leg, and it turns out the guy didn't need the amputation at all. It just turns out the surgeon needed to practice. Okay? You know, until we understand the whole picture, we can't make a judgment as to whether this is right or wrong. And when we look at modern Christianity today, where the, you know, I mean, I mean is there, honestly, folks, is there any one of you out there that's going to say that, that God, you know, He desires to save all of these people that's, 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 that's immersed, you know, wrapped up in this world religious system based on human merit that's going the wrong way. They're, they're going down that the road of law, not grace. And these are not his people. I mean, is that honestly what we're to conclude? I, because I can't do that. I can't do that. Now, maybe you can. Maybe you can. Maybe you can. May, maybe you're able to say that. Well, if only you know that these people, you know, that are uh, that don't follow this channel. If, if <laughs> that's that's funny, isn't it? May, maybe all these people that aren't on board with us and what we believe. Maybe all. Maybe this whole Christian world religious system. If only they would do something, then it wouldn't be like this. Really. Folks, I see the greatness, the grandness of God's grace blown up out of proportion in all of this. What I see is I see a God who's working behind the scenes, doing things that we, we don't have the ability to comprehend on the larger scale. And what he's doing, I believe, and again, this is my opinion, I don't ask anyone to agree with me. I believe that what he is doing is quite remarkable. There will be many left behind that won't be raptured. We know that. Who thought that they were saved. But that doesn't mean that they're not God's elect. I can't push that point home far enough here. It doesn't mean that they're not saved. It doesn't mean they won't be saved. It doesn't mean that they're not one of God's elect. They're one of God's family, a member of His family, one of God's elect. Redeemed, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. How do we know that... What gives us the right to say that if they're left behind, they're doomed? We, we, we don't have that right. We just don't have that right. What I picture, what I imagine is many, include, pastors and congregations included, that it will enter into the tribulation period 
just as as God allowed their eyes to to their heart to become hardened, their their eyes to become blinded. You know, Paul's eyes was blinded and until God opened his eyes on the road to Damascus. Are you following this? Now, I understand that that is not the traditional orthodox, you know, basic conservative view concerning all this. It's it's so easy for us, folks. It is. It's so easy for us to take and, sl and bring law back into this when, when we just got through seeing that we can't mix law and grace, that we have to be consistent with the text. It's so easy for us to say, well, if Israel had done something, if they'd just done something, or if, if Christians today, the mainstream Christian, if they would just do something, if they would just believe like we're doing, if they would just hear like we're hearing, if they would just see like we're seeing. And, and of course, who are we to bring any charge against God's elect? We, we looked at that in, a, in, in, in past studies. Folks, we can't do that. We can't do that. And as I pointed out with Bema, there will be those whose entire life's work, singular in the Greek, will be burned up, yet they themselves will be saved, yet so as through fire. Folks, we've got to be consistent. If nothing else, we've got to be consistent. We can't allow one verse to contradict another. Our theology rests upon, and, and it, fall, it, it rests upon that consistency, and it will fall apart when it's, when it's inconsistent. That's what I'm trying to impress upon you. We have to build precept upon precept. We can't take and look at one verse, like, like the Ephesians sermon that I listened to. Great sermon, you know? The Ephesians 1 sermon started out great, but it concluded, you know, the poor, poor, preacher you know he concluded it with you know well this is all only true if you will do this and then, then and then he started rattling off you know one thing after another you know that you had to do to to make that all of that true concerning yourself it was it was a, a total and complete abandonment of the truths of grace that he brought forth there in the beginning of Ephesians chapter 1 So this is basically where we're at, and uh, it's remarkable to me that, you know, just how the text reads. Here, if I can get back to uh, the 11 that I was looking at. God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David says, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and, and bow down their backs always. And then it goes into the engrafting of the Gentiles. Folks, I am absolutely 100% convinced that as we go on and continue on in this study of this chapter what we're going to see is what we're going to learn what we're going to i believe it's become, going to become just blatantly uh, obvious overly apparent that god is describing the disobedience the unbelief the blindness the stupor the, the slumber the hardness of his people, his people, which is exactly what we are confronted with today in our present day and age. They're his people, folks. They're his people. These are people for whom Christ died. Now, of course, there'll be wheat and tare, goats and sheep. You know, of course, we allow the wheat and the tare to grow together until the harvest. Of course, there's both. But only God knows those who are His. We don't have the ability to, to, to say to someone, uh, you are of your father, the devil. Only Jesus could do that. Look, I, I love you all. I truly do. I know this, this is a kind of a video I did on the run. Uh, kind of busy here trying to get things straightened out. We've got more rain coming, and I'm hoping that this, this pasture here doesn't already get more flooded than... 
turn turn more uh, into a, a a sponge than what it already is. I love you all. I truly do. I thank you for all your prayers for Oklahoma. I thank you for all your prayers for this ministry. I thank you for all the comments, the kind and generous comments that you have left me on YouTube and all the emails, phone calls, just all the support, everything. Until next time, thanks for watching.